Hello and welcome to a new episode of The Lowdown. Today I am delighted to be joined by Sam Walker, author of the Captain's Class, to discuss with him what we can learn from the world's greatest captains. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks, Connor. It's great to be here. Sam, I suppose where to begin, how and where exactly did this crazy idea begin? You know, it's funny. I, you, the one question you never ask yourself when you're writing a book is why? Like, why this book? Why am I doing this? And it's often the last thing you think of. And I, the seeds of it came on early when I started covering sports at the Wall Street Journal. I, um, I had a kind of a weird job in that I didn't really have a beat or cover any particular sport. I really covered the major championships. And um, so I saw all these great teams at the height of their power, right? Uh, that's really what I saw more than anything else. And I, I just became very, um, you know, very fascinated by what it was that made this team. Cause you know, on paper, there was nothing really that dramatically different about these players or, you know, but for, for some reason they were so much stronger as a collective. And what was it? I could never identify it. I could never predict whether a team that won a championship was going to continue to be great or was going to fall apart. It just, there was some element. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great, not just for sports, but beyond sports. I think sports is such a great laboratory for teamwork and dynamics. And it's the best place to study what's effective in a team context. And I thought if I could crack this code, maybe it would be really helpful to other people. So, you know, I, I kind of had an interest in this already. And then, you know, it was really the 2004 Boston Red Sox and American baseball that, that really made me decide to do it because I, this was a team that was talented, but, but kind of all over the place and didn't have that seriousness of purpose that I saw in great elite teams and, you know, fell way behind in the standings, you know, during the middle of the season was kind of written off. And then just overnight almost came roaring back and you know, it just became almost unbeatable. And, you know, this team had never won the world series in, since, you know, 1918. And, uh, and they came back and they, and they clawed their way through the playoffs and, and won this championship. And I thought, okay, something happened here. What, what happened? Because the same group of people suddenly just kind of became a great elite team. And uh, I wanted to, to figure out what that was, but, Really, I think it goes way back. I mean, I, I you know, when I was young, I, I grew up in Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, Oregon, Michigan, Michigan uh, sweatshirt right now. But um, but I, there was this coach, Bo Schembechler, who's an American, you know, college coach, who, who most people outside the country would have never heard of. But he was, um, he gave these famous speeches about the team and, and no one's bigger than the team. And it's about playing together as a team. And that was sort of beaten into me when I was a kid, you know, that the team is everything. And, you know, like a lot of people, I, you know, I played sports and, and was never on a great team and, you know, went out and got a job. And I realized most teams in the world are not great. You know, they don't have that level of commitment. And, uh, most of them are pretty mediocre. And I, I just made me even more fascinated by this idea of what does it take to turn a group of people um, into a, a whole that's more effective than the sum of its parts. And I think that was really the, the beginning of it. I thought there could be great value in figuring that out. So it goes way back and, and, and it kind of, some of it is the circumstances of my job, I think as a, as a sports writer, but um, that's where it all began. And I suppose just to clarify for people that haven't read the book, Sam, there's 14 teams overall in tier one. And what's unique about this whole study, Sam, is that, of course, it's worldwide. So it's not limited to any sport, never mind any country, any genre. I'm just curious. Obviously, there's a wide range and diverse mix of teams from Ferrak, Pushkas's, um, Hungary sides, Mike Magyars from the 50s. And there you have Pele's Brazil. You have the Cuban women's volleyball team, the All Blacks. I'm just intrigued as to if, there, if all these countries all these teams throughout different genres, did they share perhaps one common consensus towards a shared group or a shared belief of what leadership looked like? No, I mean, I, they really didn't. I mean, I, you know, what was interesting to me is that there are some cultures that, that have persisted and the All Blacks being probably the best one I've ever seen. Barcelona, you know, is up there. And, uh, but you see these cultures that sometimes I think are contributing 
to that ability to keep finding the right people to lead and having a good leadership dynamic. But in most cases, I really thought it was by, totally by accident. In fact, you know, a lot of the teams that were great were like the Hungarians or like the Cuban women's volleyball team. They came from an unlikely place. Like they didn't have a lot of resources or deep talent pool or, um, you know, they really had no business being better than everyone else in the world on paper. But I think the fact that they had these unconventional uh, structures or they were limited in some way, whether it was financial or through population, um, I think what happened was they, they, they didn't feel bound by the same rules. I think when you have a great talent pool and you have lots of tradition, you tend to, to lean on that and, and, you know, just put together the best players you can and, and stick to the things that have worked for you in the past. And these teams were almost free to, to mistakenly, you know, promote someone who most people would not have promoted to the captaincy or um, to create a style of play that was different from what had come before. Um, I think that lack of restriction and the ability to kind of improvise um, and to, to choose unconventional people as the leaders of the team. I mean, I, that to me was really the only characteristic that covered the majority of those teams. And I thought it was interesting. In a way, they, they weren't bound by the rules. They kind of broke the rules. And that's one of the reasons they came, um, they came up with this great formula, which is having this kind of captain to create this kind of leadership and team chemistry environment. And um, so, yeah, it was almost like a lot of them actually came to this by accident. And you spoke about before as a child growing up supporting Michigan football and the coach speaking about we before me. One guy who figured that out a bit earlier than him was uh, Lao Tzu, the ancient Chinese philosopher. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. In quote at the end of your book, Sam, where he says, a leader is best when people barely know he exists, not so good when people obey and acclaim, worst when they despise him. But of a good leader who talks little when his work is done, and his aims are fulfilled, we'll say we did this ourselves. I mean, how much is that statement at odds with what we're led to believe in nowadays in modern day society with hyper individualism, you know, which is reflected really in modern economics when it comes to football, the American football in terms of in respect to budget allocations towards star coaches, star players. It's such a great point. I love that you share that quote. I, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, it's, it's, there's, it's, I don't know how it got so entrenched in the sports world. Um, we're so quick to lionize people and to give them, to load them up with credit and blame, um, especially managers, um, you know, but also star players. I mean, I, even when they don't necessarily seek it, they get it anyway. Um, and Alex Ferguson to me is such a great example of this because you know, no one talks about what he what he what he says and what, what he said in the book was, uh, you know, once the match began, um, he thought it was his captain's responsibility to manage the team. It's a, and he would just kind of sit back and, you know, there are times where he had his arms folded in his parka and he looked like he was a little detached from the scene. And, you know, that was that was unusual because a lot of the managers are up on the touchline yelling and gesturing and hollering at the players. And his attitude was they can't even hear you. And if they can, you're just distracting them. Right. I mean, it's like I can do. Um, and that was fascinating to me because that's the point. It's it's the hardest thing. And I think the hardest message that I have is this idea of carrying the water. Um, and that being a leader is really about um, withdrawing, in a sense, personally, only thinking about the collective and not caring about how the credit is distributed or how your contribution is perceived. And, and really thinking only of everything you do in the context of is it helpful to the team, not how it will be perceived by the outside world or what it says about you or whether there's um, there are accolades in store for you if, you if you do it. And that's why Lao Tzu's comment meant so much to me because you know, that's the idea, like if you're doing it right, if you're really leading in a great way, in a way that will sustain excellence for a long time, you know, if you're getting the credit, you shouldn't get the credit. I mean, you, you sh there should be other people who might be the face of the effort. You know, your contributions are things that happen behind the scenes, out of public view. It's the day-to-day, -day, you know, constant vigilance and, and intervention and interpersonal dynamics and things that you're doing out of view. 
where no one is ever going to see them or understand the importance of what you did. Um, so you're right. And I mean, he's perfectly right in the end. It's like the best possible outcome is that, you know, you know, your contribution, you know how important your contribution was, but the world doesn't necessarily know. Other people may get more credit than you. Um, and you have to be satisfied with that. I mean, you have to be satisfied and feel like you've done your job when the people around you believe they did this themselves and they don't even fully understand how much you contributed to the effort. Um, and that's so hard. It's, it goes against, you know, every other incentive we have. I mean, a manager wants to be thought of, they want that pressure because if they succeed, they know there's great riches ahead and they're willing to take the blame, undo blame in many cases if they lose. Um, you know, because that's the road to advancement, right? And the economics of sports have been so difficult because you have the managers become so valuable and you have star players who become so valuable. So there's almost two power centers inside a team. You have the star player and the coach and and they kind of have to dance around each other and that's how the team functions. But, you know, the reality that I found in all this research was that it's really a middle manager. It's someone who can arbitrate between the manager and the rest of the players, usually not the star player, but that's the person who actually creates and holds that culture together. And those people have kind of been squeezed out just by the natural economics, all the money pouring into sports. Um, and I think that's why it's been rare to see dynasties, you know, why it's so hard for teams to uh, continue to sustain success for such a long time because they've forgotten about their model. Yeah, uh, it's intriguing on many fronts. I suppose, you know, there's a price to be paid for everything, Sam. And it's that old Hollywood image we're served up time and time again about what it means to lead, what it means to be a captain. I suppose two most famous examples that aren't in your tier one are Tom Brady and Michael Jordan. Many people want the success of a Tom Brady, Michael Jordan. They'd want the prestige of playing with a Tom Brady or Michael Jordan. But would you want both as captain? Would you be willing to sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears for that effort? I mean, one famous anecdote from your travels was when you went to Brazil and you spoke to the great Pele about his time playing in the Seleco in the 60s. And you just dropped the bombshell that um, you thought he was a captain. And he looked at you aghast, you know, as all that the blood drained from his face, that burden of leadership upon him. I mean, if that's happening to the likes of Pele, what hope <laughs> have the rest of us? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's uh, it's amazing. Well, I should clarify one thing, which is you may be reading the hardcover in the paperback version, which came out the next year. I did put Brady and the Patriots in there because they when I wrote the book, they were really even with the San Francisco 49ers of the NFL. So I didn't feel like they had. Uh, really distinguished themselves enough, but then they went to the Super Bowl that next year and wound up going. So he, Brady is, and I think Brady does typify a lot of his qualities. Jordan doesn't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, the Pele thing was such a shock to me because I assumed he was the captain of those great teams. And uh, I think most people would assume that, but I, I, I don't know why I assume, but I, I, but his attitude was, no, I wasn't the captain and, and no one really thought I should be and neither really did I because I was trying to be Pele. It's so hard to be a superstar and to play at that level. It's all the pressure on you. You kind of need to be left alone to do your own thing and to be somewhat selfish on the pitch. You've got to take shots. Even if you're not hitting them, you've got to take them. Um, a captain, you know, especially in a country like Brazil, which is so diverse, such diversity, it's so hard to hold a team together. That's a full-time job. And someone has to be doing that without the pressure of being a superstar. And, and really, when you look, go back and look at those, that great run they had of, you know, three World Cups and four tries, uh, it was this incredible spine of, of quiet leadership, Hilderado Bellini, Moro, uh, and then Carlos Alberto, who were not the face of the team or the best player. Um, and they had a lot of captains. I mean, I think that that team, uh, the Carlos, the 1970 team, I think that six players who were captains of a club team or could have been the captains of that team and they all helped each other. It was uh, understood how difficult it was to hold Brazil together. And, you know, Pele just never, I mean, he knew he had influence on the team, but I think everyone understood that that was too much. The job of captain is not glamorous. It's not about your talent or the contributions you make to the final score. It's about your willingness to do all that thankless grunt work in the shadows constantly, even if you get no credit for it. Um, 
you know, those people are hard to find and they're often pushed out. I mean, they're often not, they're not the best players. They're often people who don't end up having long careers or getting put in those positions. So um, that was a huge revelation to me. I, there is a, um, you know, there is a model that works very well. And I think one thing people don't think about enough is having a superstar player. Does that superstar player, is there, are they team oriented? You know, are they someone who is willing to be selfish to help the team in terms of their play and their time they take to work on their own craft, but also when the game is over to subsume themselves into that team, to be one of the guys and, and to follow the other leaders and to not expect any special treatment or privilege. That's what you need. I mean, that's, you know, just beyond talent. I mean, I think it's that attitude plus the talent. And those are the kinds of star players you saw in these great dynasties. Most if you bring it to the current day, I mean, more and more we are cognizant of how complex evaluating success is of arranging a team. And if we look at Pele back in the day, perhaps his abilities were better, best served at scoring goals as opposed to leading those around him. But yet leadership is about more about behaviours, less about traits perhaps. And I suppose you, like everyone else, would have been watching Italy, England, Sunday night, the, the Heroes final. And there's an interesting section in your book titled Intelligent Fouls. When we speak of intelligent fouls, we think back to that classic case of Carlos Puyol versus um, Luis Figo all those years ago. But what about Gorgio Cellini for Italy against England the other night, dragging back Bukai Osaka? I mean, there's that infamous quote from your book, life is governed by morals, but the game is governed by rules. It rings so true here. <laughs> I saw that. I thought thought the same thing. I mean, I thought that was brilliant and and not surprising. That's a classic great captain move. Is is knowing? You know, it's funny. I it was the toughest section of the book, but I saw one of those seven traits of great leaders was that that ability to bend the rules and, and to push the rules to the limit. And it was very confusing at first because you think, oh. Well, what are you, what are you, what message are you sending? You know, cheaters prosper, right? I mean, a lot of people don't like that at all. And it took me so long to figure out what was really going on. And when I, what I finally realized was that if you're a great leader, we're just not accustomed to the mindset. And the mindset is, I don't care how people perceive me. I don't care. I care about my teams and the outcome for my team. And I don't care if I, what kind of abuse I have to endure in order to get that outcome. And when you think that way, you realize that to you, the rules become another tool. You know, you're willing to, to, to subvert those general standards and the idea of sportsmanship, all this stuff that, could, that a captain is freighted with um, in order for the, to get that outcome. And what's fascinating about though is there's an art to it, right? And, and that was a great example because in that moment, it hadn't been the most physical match. I, I think he must have intuited that he wasn't going to get a red card for that. He must have known that that would be tolerated. And maybe he studied the referee and knows that that, that, that would be tolerated. Um, you know, Sergio Ramos, you know, did the same thing um, in a Champions League final uh, with uh, Farah, right? Where he, you know, um, a really dirty tackle, but he got away with it, right? I mean, he dislocated his shoulder and they wound up winning. But again, a classic behavior by, by uh, one of these captains, because the key is they don't cheat as a matter of practice. You know, they, they don't, they don't push the rules always. They, they, they find those right moments and the moments they do it is when that dynasty's on the line and when they've been winning and they may not win, that's the moment they do it. And they'll, they'll study the referees. They know the game. They're, they're very intelligent. It's that intelligent foul idea that Deschamps always talked about. Um, and they'll commit that foul and they will get away with it because they've studied it and because this is something they've really taken seriously. Um, and they know that it does two things. One, it shows their teammates that they're willing to do anything, no matter the personal consequence or to help them. Um, but it also, you know, gives them a competitive advantage. So it's, it's super important. And, and a lot, I think a lot of um, players who do these kinds of things are often seen as, as problem problematic or, or lacking in character. It's almost disqualifies them from a leadership role. But you have to look at the intent. Was the intent to injure, to, to, to make a shortcut, or was the intent to hold that team together uh, and keep the winning going in a moment where everything was on the line, and um, to, you, even if there was personal sacrifice? So 
I think it's really important for managers and people to think about these moments and really think about what was happening in that moment before they dismiss these people as being dirty players or morally defective in some way. But, um, but yeah, it's super important. I mean, it's, um, it's just part of it is we just have that Hollywood notion of what a leader is. And some of that is this nobility of spirit and sportsmanship and, you know, doing the right thing and being a role model and someone who really cares more about the team than themselves, they don't care about any of that stuff. You know, and, and we're so inclined to think that they should, that I think sometimes it gets in the way, um, you know, of, of, you know, understanding what, what a leader needs to do in a situation like that. But uh, yeah, I, I saw that and I thought, you know, this is probably going Italy's way. You know, I thought that was a great leadership moment in that game. And for all those pop psychologists out there, Sam, you would have seen, of course, the semifinal as well in his antics with Jordi Alba. Before the, pen, before the penalty kicks. I mean, yeah. where do you stand on that? Is that, a, there's, you know, such a fine line you can draw on sportsmanship. Personally speaking, I thought it was brilliant. I didn't think there was any, you know, it wasn't meditated or anything on Chiellini's behalf. This is the thing that I, I think I, I've spent so much time thinking about this and, and I think this is the best way to explain it. I mean, I think about hockey and, and, hockey in, in, in the NHL, right? It's a great example. It's because here you are and, and on one side of the boards inside the, the arena, there are two guys that are punching each other. I mean, savagely, getting in a savage fight, right? And, uh, and then on the other side of that glass, not two feet away, there are, are two people in the stands. And if they start punching each other, they're going to jail, right? Because that's assault and that's a crime. But two feet away, the same thing is happening. And it, it's, it's within the, it's allowed within this, you know, so all this research that's been done on this and, and on athletes shows that um, there is a game mentality. There is a, um, and they understand that the laws that we, that govern us, you know, the laws of society are different from the rules of sport and, and intentionally so, and it's why there is a referee, you know, it's, it's, there are gray areas. Some of this is just open to interpretation and um, you know, it's different. So, I mean, if you do break a rule, uh, you know, in spirit, it's really still up to the referee to decide if it was within the bounds of what's acceptable. So, you know, I, th I think we're sitting in the stands and we're governed by the laws of society, judging people that are on the field that are being governed by the laws of sport. And there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And I think, you know, we all need to get over ourselves a little bit. I mean, the problem is everyone thinks that what these players do on the pitch influences kids. And, and I completely agree that kids should not do these things. And youth sports, when you're learning and developing, sportsmanship is very important. I think it's a life lesson, but we're talking about professionals who are trying to win and the goal is to win. You know, the goal of, of youth sports is not necessarily to win, right? It's their bigger roles. Um, so we have to be able to teach, coaches need to teach people differently and, and to tell them look, that works in, in a champion league's final, but it's, it's not appropriate for this level of, of play. So I think it's a simpler message than it seems, but uh, yeah, I mean, I had you know, Ru Rudiger in the, in the champions league, Rudiger is a great rule bender. I call him um, Tom Brady, you know, was a rule bender, right? I mean, he got suspended for deflating the footballs. The difference is he got caught. He didn't get away with it. That's the thing about the great ones is they, they just had this knack for knowing when to do it and how to get away with it. I'm not such a Patriots fan there in the background. Not too happy with the I know. I need to... <laughs> Pardon me for one thing. I'm going to get quite a bit Come on. For Sam as well, Italy's opponents, England, last Sunday, their manager, Gareth Southgate, someone you've worked with, and you've spoken openly with him about this concept of the, can of the captain's class. Um, he took something like 12, 13 months to decide on Harry Kane being his England captain. And some people were still perplexed by it. I suppose, do you understand his decision-making? No, I really do. I mean, I haven't spoken with him since, since he made that decision about, about the team's chemistry, but I've been such a fan of the way he's, he's assembled that team. Um, he has gone out of his way to cultivate and to pursue players. Uh, Connor Cody is a great example of someone who wasn't even in the Premier League um, early on when he was kind of tracking him and is a great leader and captain for his club. I think he had seven, six or seven captains and then 
another large group of players who've, who've, who've captained their side at some point or, or captained England. Um, and, and he's really put together such a great um, leadership group. So one of the things that I've been doing since the book came out is, is focusing on how you build a team-wide leadership dynamic. So captains are, are crucially important, I think. Um, they're underrated in that I think that you need someone who is ultimately, you know, responsible for everything that happens and is very vigilant and is going to have, going to run into that burning building and acknowledge that problem that if no one else will. You need that, some person who is a great liaison with the coach, works very closely with the coach, has a good partnership. There needs to be that central character that everyone will look to in a crisis. I mean, when when things go bad, you know, you can't have a committee meeting. Like there needs to be one person everyone knows is going to, to do something and is, is they're going to rely on that person. So captains are underrated in that sense, but they're also overrated in that, you know, what I've found in, in all my research is that there are actually 18 distinct leadership roles inside a team. And I have identified them. I've actually modeled them with a personality assessment. So I have a sense of what kinds of people tend to do these roles. But when you look at that list, you realize nobody can do everything. I mean, there's no such thing as a, as a complete leader because some of these leadership roles are contradictory. You can't be the sheriff who upholds team standards and be the papa bear type who takes care of you know, tough cases on the team and is there for people emotionally. It's hard to do the both of those jobs. So you can't do everything. So a great captain will do a certain subset of those jobs, but they need help. They need other people making contributions. So what I found actually, which is getting back to Harry Kane, you know, Kane was unusual in that he was the star player, right? He's the person who they're depending on to score. He's the Pele, right? And, and if you use that analogy, and that's those people are, tend to not be captains. Not that they can't do it. It's just they generally don't have the bandwidth to do everything that's necessary. And I think that was uh, Gareth's hesitation you know, was, uh, is that too much to ask of Harry Kane? Because we need him to focus on being the goal scorer and doing what no one else on the team can do. Um, but I think in the end, what he figured out and something that I was behind him in, in figuring out was that uh, you can, it doesn't really matter who's wearing the armband, as long as you have every important leadership role being handled by someone. And to me, Harry Kane is what I call the North Star. Um, he, you know, he is that, that star in the Tom Brady sense, who's not really interested in personal accolades, who's not chasing the spotlight, who's not in the limelight, who's incredibly team focused and is there and shows that he cares about his teammates. And I think you saw him consoling his teammates after, after the, the match, we, you know, which was, was very heartfelt and you see the role that he plays. People know, well, look, Harry Kane's a huge star and he is completely in this and completely committed. That is a huge and important contribution he's making as a leader. Now, is he the communicator who is always in everyone's directing traffic and always inserting himself in every situation? No, you know, is he, um, is he the sheriff, the person who's, you know, gonna box your ears when you're, you're stepping outside the team's standards. No, he's not that person. So he's got other people on the team. He has a great cast of leaders and he's got Jordan Henderson, um, you know, Harry Maguire has been great for them. Eric Dyer was great for them before. Um, he wasn't in this, this, um, on this side, but you know, he's got this great cast of characters who are handling a lot of the other leadership responsibilities. And that's all you need. I mean, what I've realized is that, look, it's not that complicated. There's, there's really 18 jobs on this team. And you just ask yourself, are they all getting done? And are they being done well? And do you have a, a do you have a central figure, a person who uh, works well with the coach, but is also that that last line of defense, that person who you know is going to act in those situations, that ultimate uh, person is ultimately responsible. I would call them the captain. They don't have to wear the armband as long as they exist. So my, my approach is, Let's look at your team and figure out what, where the gaps are. And let's look at what your head coach does and his style. And, and let's look at your captain. How do they complement each other? What's left over? And who's filling in the gaps? You can go all the way down until you have a team that is complete in its, in its leadership contributions and chemistry. Um, and I think it's something you can plan and you can do very intentionally. Um, teams plan everything. Every, every second of training, everything the players eat, they're, 
the diets or nutrition that the travel schedule it's like von schlieffen's invasion of france through belgium half the time and they've got every detailed plan except leadership right except the leadership dynamics of the team and, and what's going to happen with certain people come and go and you know my whole message and what the work i do with teams is like let's be intentional about this you know and let's let's really try to build the best possible leadership culture and, and an environment that allows it to flourish and you know, I think uh, Southgate has just done a terrific job. I mean, I think he's still on that journey and maybe has a little ways to go, but um, I think that is, that's his perspective too. And um, that's a tough place. England is a tough place um, for a national team. I mean, the press is brutal. The fans are pessimistic and very, very inclined to go negative and they tend to eat their they tend to eat people up as quickly as they lionize them. And, um, and the job I think he's done is just phenomenal. Yeah, and yeah, so good. I'd have to second that. Um, tremendous character. And he's exemplified that all throughout the tournament, albeit under very difficult circumstances, especially the past few days. But getting back to what you spoke about, these different personality traits or leadership traits, um, Slightly perplexed, but at the same time, really, really intrigued because work you do, you do, it, of course, within the A teams, they may have a roster of up to 15 players. Soccer teams, 23, 24 players. American football teams, 53, 54 players. You see where I'm going with this one. Yeah. Counterintuitively, would it be better? I mean, does that approach, that dynamic work best? with an NFL roster where you have 53 people to divvy up 18 roles between, or is it the inverse? No, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it's pretty, it's proven to be pretty universal because, you know, I love NFL teams and I work with an NFL team very closely, but I love NFL teams because American football is bizarre. I mean, there's really three teams in one. There's your offense, your defense, and your special teams. And then you have your position group. You have the offensive line. You have the, the defensive backfield. You, so there are so many teams within that team. Um, and, you know, so you need to look at each unit differently. I mean, I'll look at the offense and its leadership dynamics and the defense. Uh, and then there's the overall team. And, and you, you have to evaluate them all differently. Do they, do they all have all the leadership uh, characteristics that they need? Um, but, you know, the size is really not that important. I mean, in fact, you know, the NBA, you would think with only five starters, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, the dynamic might be different. But so I've spent a lot of time studying the, the Golden State Warriors uh, when they had that great dynasty going uh, and, and spent hours with uh, Andre Iguodala, who's one of my favorite um, captains in, in modern times, uh, really was the heart of that team. Everyone thinks, oh, Steph Curry, you know, he was must have been the captain or maybe Kevin Durant or Draymond Green. Um, you know, Steve Kerr comes from two of the great dynasties, the Bulls and, and the San Antonio Spurs and just has this fundamental understanding of, of what a well-led team looks like. And um, he has helped foster this environment, but, you know, Andre Iguodala and Steph Curry have had this conversation. You know, the great leader is usually not the star. Um, Steph Curry is, it's, it's Andre Iguodala as the captain and the heart of that team was. And then you had Steph Curry and Draymond Green as his kind of different poles of leadership. You know, Steph Curry playing that Harry Kane kind of North Star role, that team oriented superstar and then you had Draymond Green who brings the fire and the heat and the passion and the aggression uh, and you know Iguodala handling all the sort of difficult moments in between uh, and being that that surrogate coach that partner to Steve Kerr um, so and then they had you know Sean Livingston who was kind of their their, their wise elder papa bear type and um, and they had Kevin Durant who was you know kind of dogged and relentless and playing some of those roles as well so you when you start looking at ba even basketball teams i mean i think you know you, you need really good leaders you know you're, you're, you're you need people who have a variety of skills and can do more things i think on a basketball team because there's fewer people to do them um i think it's a bigger leadership challenge the smaller the team is um but so far i mean i you know i've not seen a I've not seen any team of any size where I didn't think those roles were, were applicable. Um, and that's what I do. You know, I, I, I worked with dozens of teams, especially the American college teams on an exercise where people will try to look at what are the leadership roles. I'll give them mine. I'll identify theirs. And, and I, I kind of kick the tires on it and I keep 
I keep coming back to the same list. You know, I think it's, it's getting pretty universal. I mean, I really think there is teams are teams. And I think on any team, there's a certain kind of bundle of, of, of leadership roles that need to be played. One way that I break it down though, I think to help people understand it better is I believe there's really four, there are really four elements um, of leadership inside it, four basic elements. There's uh, connection, which is, you know, camaraderie, how, how much how much people feel part of the group and how connected they feel. Uh, there's contagion and that's your, um, you know, the, what the team is feeding off of. Are people able to keep them calm in stressful moments and to, to pump them up in, in intense moments and to motivate them emotionally? Um, and then there's execution. Execution is just, are you executing the game plan? Are you cool under fire? Are you staying true to, to, to who you are and, and executing the plan? Uh, and the final one is conflict. You know, how well do you argue? You know, how well do you have people who enforce standards? Do you have people who show, bring the fight to the opponents and, and police the team? And, and, you know, are you comfortable having dissent and differing opinions and coming to a compromise on tactics? Um, and those are really the four areas and all the, I, all the, um, the different roles that I've identified kind of fall into those buckets. Uh, so that's a way of looking at it. And, you know, you can just look at your team and say, do we have enough conflict? You know, do we have enough contagion? Do we have enough connection? Do we have enough execution? Um, and just starting there, I think if you, if you analyze your group that way, you can start to see what the gaps are. I think it's fascinating divvying it up into these 18 different leadership traits. For me, it's a fantastic fail safe, if you will, against the concept of social loafing, which for those that don't know, it's the tendency of individuals to put forth less effort when part of a group. And where this overlaps for me is Didier Deschamps when he speaks about the concept of being a water carrier. It's something which I came across unconsciously the other day with Bill Shankly. He spoke about his great Liverpool team in this, of the 70s being akin to a team of pianists. He says, you need eight to carry the piano and three to play it. Perhaps he just wasn't articulate enough at the time to describe what he was feeling. But nonetheless, I think this concept of 18 different leadership traits, although huge quantitatively speaking, gives you that case study, that ample evidence to suggest and to provoke what you want to bring towards your players, bring into that organization. Because it's all well and good to have videos of Steph Curry, Andrea Godola doing this and hear the anecdotal evidence. But how do you implement that? That's huge. Yeah. No, it's really, it's, it's, it's a counterintuitive way to think about your team. And, um, you know, but when you start thinking about it that way, I mean, this is the mistake. This is the reason dynasties are so rare because I think uh, too often the managers, the people running the team, they don't, they don't really understand that, that there's a difference between the period where you're trying to make the breakthrough you know, most teams are trying to win something, right? Whatever their Super Bowl is, whatever their, the trophy they're chasing, they're chasing that and they're making all these adjustments and, ch and changes in order to, to make that breakthrough. And there's really three phases to, to a dynasty that I found. There's that period where you're building and you're building. It. That is more art than science, all right? It's a, it's, there's so many factors. It's a very complicated, dynamic thing. I can't begin to tell you how to do it. Um, and, but once you get there, once you get to that threshold that you've been trying to get to, that's where this kicks in. That's where the only thing that will carry you through is the leadership dynamic of the team, because you've got the talent, clearly, you won. You've got the tactical know-how, you've got the personnel, you've got, everything is in place for you to be great. You have the greatness. So now your job is totally different. Your job is not to continue tweaking and, and trying to, make big improvements. It's about understanding what makes that team great and making sure that you protect it and that you don't take unconsciously remove some very important piece that you didn't understand. That's what most teams do. They'll let someone go and they don't realize the role they were playing in, in terms of the team's cohesion and the ability to play together. And that's why they fall apart. I mean, it's, this, it's essentially the same people and maybe even a better group of players on paper, but they just can't get the job done. 
And <clears throat> that's the key thing. That little, there's this little window that I found where after you've made the breakthrough, it's the second phase of the dynasty. It's, it's really committing to who you are. And that's where most teams fail because they don't understand really why they got there. Most managers don't pay enough attention to the small interpersonal relationships and, and uh, chemistry inside that team. They're looking at big moments and big spectacular things that people did that were very obvious and public. They're not looking at the small things happening behind the scenes and the relationships that allow the team to get through difficulty. Um, they don't look at the moments where the team just got through by the skin of their teeth. You know, those moments where they, they might have lost, but didn't. That's where you really learn about the leadership of your team. It's not the big triumph or the big loss. It's those little moments. And you have to, in that short window, understand completely why your team works on a chemistry, on a DNA, interpersonal level. And you have to commit to it. And you have to get rid of the people that are working against it and, and promote the people that are helping it and bring in, start to create a plan to bring in people who will backstop that chemistry in the future. So you have that little window and you may lose in that little window. I mean, so a lot of great dynasties that have broken through and then had a little struggle and then come back and be great. Um, but that's the key moment. It's one season, two seasons, maybe, maybe three. And then once you've, you've started winning again, then you're in the third phase, which is really, it's the maintaining phase. And um, that there's a whole nother series of rules that go with, with maintaining a, 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 an effective culture once it's already in place. Um, but, you know, I don't think a lot of managers think of it that way, right? I think they win and they think I'm, they're just doing the same thing they were doing before they won, not realizing that, you know, you've got something here that works and you need to protect it. Don't keep tweaking. You don't want to tweak the things you don't like about it. You need to understand and protect it. It's interesting when you speak of that being medium to long term over two, three years, but we've seen substantial success most recently over the case of four months, be it Thomas Tuchel at Chelsea. And it just goes to show, Sam, the short term nature of the sports industry in general. I mean, Chelsea win the Champions League May 27th, May 29th. We've had the Euros the past month and lo and behold, Chelsea have sneakily be begun pre-season training again earlier on this week, you know, that just goes to show we have no time to reflect upon these successes. But as a Chelsea fan, one thing I noticed immediately, Tuchel arriving at the tail end of a transfer window, one thing he did do that he was in control of was reintegrating Chelsea's captain, Cesar Azpilicueta. Now Tuchel, as known to us all, is a huge advocate of your work, Sam. What do you think was behind his thinking there? No, I, I think he saw a team that was, um, you know, it just didn't have the leadership. It, it wasn't valuing leadership correctly. And it wasn't, um, you know, it, it was emphasizing tactics and talent over um, and sacrificing chemistry and internal dynamics for it. And um, I mean, it was very clear the case. Everyone knew that that team had the talent to be great. And it was so dysfunctional. Um, you know, I, I love to think he just went back and read my book again and thought he's, you know, but, you know, it's funny because Asma Coletta is, is such a great example of, of the type of leader. I mean, he meets all the criteria that I've, I've talked about. You know, I, I'm sure to Tuchel, like who thinks in that way, it was very clearly an undervalued asset. And I think putting him back into the leadership role in a prominent role and getting him back into the game uh, more often was um, kind of a no brainer for him. Um, but I think he also saw, I mean, look, you know, I, 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 so there was a great moment after that Champions League final. Uh, it was a little interaction between Pep Guardiola, who knows a lot about great captains and, and Asby. And, and there was a little, there was a, a little handshake and a eye contact between them. And I, I could just tell that Pep has enormous, understands the value of a player like that. I mean, this is someone who's had, you know, Carlos Puyol, he's had Philip Lom, you know, um, and he's had uh, Vincent Company, another great. Leader. I mean, he's had a string of incredibly great captains. I'm really extremely good, uh, and I think he understands. I think I think once you get to this place where you understand the leadership dynamics that are that, of, a, of a great team, um, you start to recognize those people. And I, I, that moment said everything to me. I mean, he knows that he's not going to beat that guy. And I mean, you, you hear Guardiola often talk about the captain of a team, uh, an effective one, and, and talking about how important they are and how, um, and how they have to game plan against the captaincy in a way. Um, 
so yeah, though the, the Chelsea thing was such a great example because of the speed at which this happens. You know, and that's the thing that's been really shocking to me is when you set out to actually intentionally implement and do and make changes that improve your leadership dynamic, how fast it can happen, and how quickly it happens. Because, you know, what I've found is, you know, I've done these meetings where I meet with the team and, you know, professional athletes who were seeing everything, right? And, and they, and we talk about the different leadership roles and who's doing that. And I always thought it would be really corny because, you know, if the team decides, oh, you so-and-so needs to be our, our, our igniter, you know, we don't have an igniter, we need, and you see that person then doing this, those igniter things on the field to fire one up. You know, I always thought that players would say, oh, look, he's just doing that thing we talked about, right? They'd be kind of cynical about it. But what I've discovered, which is shocking and amazing is that if you do something selfless on behalf of the collective, on behalf of the team, that is not clearly not something that's in your best interest. It's you're doing some behavior that helps the team. That is a powerful thing. And everybody respects that. Everybody appreciates that. I don't care what your motives are. I don't care why you're doing it or whether it was something that you talked about in a, in a seminar or heard about or read about on the internet. They don't care why. They just care that you're doing it. It's just that positive pro-social team behavior. You know, when everyone on the team is doing it and doing little things that are positive and, and contributing to the collective and, and no one's doing things that are clearly self important and not in the interest of the team, that's all it takes. I mean, if you just have a lot of people that are making contributions to the whole, um, things can change very quickly. And I think that's what happened with Chelsea when you have a, you know, Aspicueta who's so selfless and, and so but tough, you know, and, and demanding, but also, you know, always thinking about the group and it's and the group outcome. And you put someone like that in the middle, you're making a statement about what you value, but you're also, you know, letting a lot of people off the hook. You know, I mean, a lot of people are, are great players who are not great leaders and don't have the time they, they need to devote and are watching, you know, situations happen that are not good inside the team and feel powerless to contribute. And it gets them frustrated and distracted and they, and, when there is someone finally at the center who they know is not going to miss anything and is going to take care of something if it falls through the cracks, they're kind of free to do what they need to do and to focus on their game and to focus on doing their job and being the best they can be. And there's a lot of relief, you know, when you have the right person in that role. And it's a very quick, it can be a very quick uh, turnaround. I mean, I've seen this happen in the space of one season, you know, with more intentional work. Um, on the leadership group of a team. Um, I really think it can happen, not overnight, but, you know, very quickly. And I think that was the, the great thing to me about Chelsea. Same players that were dysfunctional, falling apart, um, a little reshuffling of the dynamic inside that team and they're European champions. I mean, I think, I think that's a pretty good indication of the power of, of, of that chemistry. Yeah. And I'd like to thank you for playing a small part in Chelsea's Champions League triumph. <laughs> small part. <laughs> a huge part. Very Apologies. But um, Very small part. <laughs> but um, I suppose as we begin to close, Sam, I mean, surely there, there's countless sports out there, but surely there has to be sports other than football that are getting this dynamic right. They're getting what? I'm sorry. Has to be other sports apart from football getting this dynamic right, this leadership. Yeah, no, there are. I mean, I see it. You know, I, I see it in in a lot of places. I mean, I, um, you know, I work with a lot of college sports in the U.S. Um, really to build my database and to um, and, and to help them out. And yeah, you know, I've seen swim teams that have this kind of chemistry which is unusual because that's not really a team sport, right? It's more of an individual, individual sport. Um, but yeah, you, you don't, you don't, you don't see it in a lot. There's some sports where you're not really seeing it. I mean, I was seeing a great example of it um, at the same time. So, you know, I, I, I'm always hard pressed to come up with examples, but you know, Sue Bird, uh, is a great one. She's the captain of the U.S. women's basketball team, and she it was one WNBA titles with her team in Seattle. She's won everywhere she's been. I mean, she's not a star player, but she's a great captain, leader. 
Um, and, I, and I see it in that sport. I see the US women's team um, has that culture and it keeps repeating, making the right decisions and, and having the right leaders. Um, I see it there. I, I've seen it in, you know, handball teams. You know, I've seen it in, in cricket. You know, I, I've seen, you know, teams improve dramatically when they had a different kind of leadership. And, you know, I've, I, I guess so my point is that I, you know, I've also worked with, I work with businesses and I work with corporate teams and I, I've worked with the military and uh, military units, like from the general command level down to individual rifle squads in the Marine Corps. Um, and I've yet to see a situation where um, some conscious thought and some, um, some, some really, you know, intentional development and, and thought given to the leadership and how it works and how it's constructed hasn't helped. So, um, you know, of course, it's self-serving for me to say teams are universal and this is, you know, a common thing. But I, you know, I really have never, honestly, have never found a team in any line of work that has had long-term sustained success that has not had a leadership dynamic like this. I mean, I honestly believe that once you break through, there's really only one way. I mean, you have to sustain it. You have to have talent and tactics and all the other things, but the only thing that is not negotiable is that you have the right leadership environment. And without that, you will not continue being excellent. I've not, I've not found a team in any of these realms that has had that kind of long-term success that did not have that kind of culture, that kind of leadership culture. Um, so I do think it's universal. I really do. And I, I think it applies, you know, at, at almost any level of sport as well. That was my next question, Sam. I was going to ask, are many of these principles transferable to business, any other industries? Because as we all know, sports really is a fascinating anomaly. And I think Garrett Southgate explained this best on a podcast last year. He spoke about the single-minded minded focus and dedication to your craft to just reach the program. However, in his own experience of football and many other different industries, which he examined, afterwards, you need that broader perspective to reach higher heights. Is that something which you recognize? Yes. No, it's a great point. I mean, I think, I think that's the, the lesson that we can learn from, from being on a well-led team and sports is it's really the place where most young people learn about teamwork and and i think it's so valuable in, in helping people develop the right instincts and understand what makes a team work but it does apply i mean it, it applies to life in so many ways whenever you're in any kind of collective effort i mean i think it applies to families you know i think it applies to the way you think about uh, any group that you're involved in that, that you're trying to improve um, you know, business is, is, is different and in some ways it's much harder uh, than sports because, you know, there are sports, there's really the hierarchies. You've got the manager and you've got the players, you know, in a, in a business, you've got an org chart and they have seven or eight levels of management. Um, what I found in business, which is really fascinating, is that, you know, we didn't talk a lot about coaches and the role the coaches play in this culture. Um, but in business, most people have to do two things they have to be a great captain when they're when they're part of a group part of a team they also have to be a great coach in another context because they may have direct reports and they have to be overseeing a team most people who are in the middle of an organization have to do both and they're very different roles being a great coach and being a great captain are are different the, the collaboration between them is super important but the mindset is different and it's often difficult for a great captain to become a coach that's why Deshaun is is such a uh, an amazing guy because he's succeeded in both realms. It's not that common. You know, a lot of people have trouble making that transition, changing their mindset to think like a coach and to play the coach side of that. Um, but yeah, that's, it's difficult. You know, that the people always say, well, in sports, you know, you gotta, you can trade someone, you can, you know, you can draft people, you, you know, you have the constant turnover in a lot of businesses. You can't just fire someone, even if you know they're not, job done. So um, I think the bar is a lot higher. Uh, but I think it makes this, this kind of thinking more important. Because I think um, in business, especially the, I always tell business clients, they're always, they, they come in and say, well, we have a problem with engagement, you know, or having a problem, or people just aren't engaged in the work enough, or they need to feel a sense of purpose, or, you know, we need more diversity, we need, uh, we're having trouble with retention, you know, we're having trouble with millennials, we can't figure millennials out, we can't figure, 
And, you know, all these things, I mean, all the research I've seen and every anecdotal, all the anecdotal evidence I have suggests that there's one cure for all of this, which is great teams. You, you, you have great managers throughout the organization and people who are on good teams. Nothing, everyone wants to be in a great team. I don't care if you're a boomer or you're a millennial or you're you know, a space sailing. Everyone loves being on a great team and you'll be more loyal. You'll be more engaged. You will be, you will have a sense of purpose. You will enjoy your work more, you'll be more productive. And, um, you know, it's really crucial, I think, that businesses start thinking, you know, about not just who their CEO is and who's, you know, in, in the big office, but, you know, how they hire managers all the way down to the mail, you know, and, you know, you need a strong spine going all the way down that organization. And, uh, um, you know, there's a, there's actually, it's pretty, it's not that complicated. It's just a different set of criteria than, you know, who has the best sales this quarter, or who's the biggest star. It's, it's really who has the leadership instincts and who's doing the work behind the scenes for the, on behalf of the company. That's not necessarily about their personal advancement. And, you know, I think the same rules, the same rules, the same basic principles apply really in any, in any team situation. That's the great thing about the book though, Sam. It really is a seminal piece of research that has proven already to stand the test of time. But um, I suppose like the great dynasties and great captains before you, you're not resting on your laurels. Um, what are you up to now and what plans have you for the future? Well, you know, since the book came out, I, I it was amazing because I, I assumed I would be running around trying to defend the fact that Michael Jordan's not in, in my, you know, great list of great captains and there's things like that. Uh, but instead, the, the, the first question was like, okay, great, let's do this. How do we do this? So that's really what, what takes up most of my time now. I and mean, I still do a lot of speaking and occasional column writing for the journal. Um, but my, the bulk of my work now is, is working with individual teams and uh, companies and, and a handful of uh, uh, teams and really getting into the weeds of how you actually do this. So I hope in the future what I'll be able to do is put together a, a very uh, comprehensive program, a uh, very kind of you know, with tons of research behind it that will allow people to to use it as a tool to look at their own teams and, and to scale this beyond what I'm able to do myself. Um, so that's kind of the idea. I mean, I, I think at this point, I, you know, I feel like I've been so lucky in, in stumbling onto this whole thing. And, you know, I just, I really want to try to help people and, and to try to, you know, just make sure that some of these great leaders out there um, who might otherwise be overlooked or not overlooked and are given the opportunities and that there's just more good teams in the world, you know, in every, every phase of life, because I think better teams, you know, in, in, in business and in politics and all these different you know, realms of, of, of endeavor, you know, would be a good thing for us. So I, I hope I can make some, some contribution to that um, by just continuing on and doing more research and, and, and trying to trying these things in the field and really trying to develop a, um, a repeatable model for how you build a stronger team. Like us all, I'm very much intrigued to keep up with your own journey, Sam. And um, where's best to catch you online? Uh, well, I have a Twitter account. It's Sam Walkers with an S. Um, and I have a website, which is by samwalker.com. Um, I'm not super prolific uh, out there in social media or anything, but uh, um, but you can always contact me through through the website if you want to answer questions, try to answer as many questions and engage with as many, as many people as I can. So. Really, really illuminating to speak with you. Could have spoke for hours of on end. Um, I've spoken before, camera. Uh, you visited Ennis once or twice, so must extend an open invite, and we eagerly anticipate your return sometime soon. You don't need any excuse to go to Ireland. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Sam. Thanks, Connor.